Hello and welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass with me, Phil. And I'm doing a live session today where I'm going to be stitching in a jewellery case. Now, jewellery case making is a very traditional craft, not very often seen anymore. So it's something I'm looking at bringing back and teaching people how to make them the traditional way. So today I am stitching in the zip, which is going to be holding everything together. So we're going live. Hi guys, welcome. So a few of you already, that's good to see. So using an awl here, because I'm going through quite a few layers of leather. One, two, three, four, five layers. In fact, plus zip tape. So a little tricky just to use the pricking iron. Ah, oh, Ukraine. Hello from England. So this, uh, I'll just show you the top half. This is what I'm working on. In fact, I'll show you a little bit more. So this is a jewelry case. Obviously it will look a little bit more like a jewelry case when it's done. Hinge on the back there. So right now I'm stitching in the zip on this one before I attach the hinge. And it just makes it a little bit easier to stitch them separately. And oops. Sorry guys, hit the microphone there. And I've also got a uh, little zip puller. Difficult to see there. It's actually foiled, so gold foiled. So it matches the, uh, the teeth. So foiled alligator, which is something I show you how to do in the course. Pretty cool actually. Hello from Northern Minnesota. How's it going? Oh, it's not too cold up there right now. I hear it gets pretty chilly. Straight out of Philadelphia, shining shoes. <laughs> shining shoes is like therapy, I love that. Something I actually look forward to. Nothing quite like a pair of good handmade shoes with a mirror polish. In Alsace, France, and that's next to the Haas Tannery, making a, I missed that. A slim something, making a slim gala bag. Uh, I love Alsace, really nice. A friend of mine um, does trunk restoration in uh, Haguenau, Le Malincoin. It's a really nice place, good food there as well. I like Alsace, it's kind of a hybrid between France and Germany, because of course it's been German, French, and German and French. Quite a few times I'm led to believe. Good white wine as well, I like that. Uh, some Italian flags coming through there. That's cool. Just gonna move this down a little bit. Because sometimes my beard catches that little mic. It makes a bit of a weird noise. Good thing about this all, this is the uh, Jerome David all. I just gave it a sharpen today. <laughs> it needed it. Going through all of this. Stitching this quite fine, uh, 2.7 millimeter. Using a uh, 0.45 millimeter thread, or about 0.45, I think it is. Love to see your workshop, says James Billings Furniture. <laughs> It's more of a studio these days, a filming studio. <laughs> so this is a pink alligator. I've gone for something a little bit more exotic on this because it's a, a small item. Uh, I don't very often work with pink. This is almost like a salmon pink. There's a touch of uh, orange in there, just a touch. And I've gone for a slightly darker shade of that in the thread, so it's not a heavy contrast. You can see the thread, but it's not so overt that it's taken the attention away from, of course, that beautiful skin. So it's a semi-contrast, which is usually my favorite, to be fair. And the interior on this is gonna be in suede. So there's gonna be ring compartments, earring compartments, and all sorts of, uh, Weird and wonderful little contraptions inside. 
to hold your jewelry nice and safe. This is really cool to make for someone as well. If you know someone who wears jewelry and likes to travel, this is a really cool present to make them. And if you really like them, you can make it in exotic leather. But I think this would be really nice in ostrich as well. And I'd love to see this in uh, stingray as well. That would be that would be incredible. Though this is the mainly turned edge. Everything on here is turned edge. So there's no raw edges. There's no edge finishing necessary outside of the little zip puller. So uh, it would be a bit of a trick to do it in uh, in stingray. It would have to be a cut edge. Unless you want it to be really bulky. Uh, yes, this is going to be uh, out. Uh, it's due out on the 8th if everything goes to plan. Like most other videos. So it'll be coming out on the, uh, for the plan members and Golden Ore members uh, very shortly. It's going to be a two-parter on this one because it's not as simple as a glasses case. It's a little bit more complex, but the techniques on this are fantastic for so many other projects, especially for making small boxes, earring boxes, cufflink boxes, watch box with its own little cushion inside. You know, the list is absolutely endless. Um, and it's always good to offer people difficult to find products, you know, that are handmade. So many uh, times you can so easily find uh, nothing, there's nothing wrong with making card wallets and uh, key fobs and you know basic bags and things like that, but uh, they're made by a lot of people. So I always like to come out with something that showcases new techniques in the masterclass, but also a product that is uh, a little hard to find, mainly because a lot of the techniques have been forgotten or just not used anymore or uh, the, you know, the techniques are bypassed for mass production and fake stitching and things like that. Because you really can't make a jewellery case like this without some form of hand stitching. Do you have a lot of uh, blacksmiths, metal workers around you because of your Kiridashi collection? Kiridashi, I think that's a Japanese knife, isn't it? Or something like that. Um, I have... English pairing knives. Uh, no, I use a company up north called BBS Steel um, and I buy small amounts of uh, high speed steel from them. A uh, little bar stock. I know someone who works there. They wouldn't normally deal with individuals. Uh, but that's, that's what I make back there. Very simple. How do you cut, prick and stitch Stingray? With difficulty, my friend, I wish I could explain it with words, but I'd have to show you. I do have a course on it, of course, uh, the Stingray card wallet. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to do without damaging your pricking irons. So I wouldn't want to tell you, and then you go off and you haven't had a chance to see what it actually looks like. Hello, what kind of thread string do you use? How thick is it? In this particular instance, this is Philly Chinois, uh, 532, I believe. Uh, but I, of course I use all different different types of threads depending on what I'm working on and the demands of the product. Uh, do I make them? Yeah, well, not the round knife uh, there. Uh, next to it is a, a Blanchard that I didn't make. Um, but there's one, two, I'll show you. I'll show you the ones I did make, it's easier. So these are the pairing knives that I use. This is the first one that I made. This is a, a English pairing knife with a slightly uh, steeper angle, or shallower angle, I should say. Less acute, how about that? Um, than this one up here, which is a George Barnsley. And so this is high speed steel wrapped with uh, a little goat skin, as you can see, just for comfort. Great blade, very hard, about 62 Rockwell. Uh, this is a hybrid English-German pairing knife. So English, um, very typical angle for an English pairing knife there. But a very slight belly to it, which means you can take, you can pair leather in the center rather than the edge. And each of the corners are away from the leather. So you can, 
you know, change the angle and change the amount of depth that you have on there. Uh, it's got a little ostrich skin wrap on there, because why not? Uh, actually, no, this is the, I think this was the first one I actually fashioned. This is a, a, a putty knife. Very, very thin. It's about half a millimeter thick on the end there. Uh, it's really good because it's flexible. Very shallow angle on that uh, single bevel there. Uh, really good for things, really soft skins like sheepskin, stuff like that. I mean, it doesn't hold an edge for very long. It's adequate, of course, uh, but I hardened it. I just uh, heated it up and then dunked it in uh, vegetable oil, I believe, to harden it. And this one here is uh, simply a hacksaw blade with a bit of thickness built out onto it. And uh, that's... Uh, what have we got? Oh, I can't tell which type of lizard, but it's lizard skin. Uh, great thing about it is it flexes really, really well. So if I need to really get a steep angle or press down to get shallow, then I can do that. So that's, that's my collection. Those are the ones that I've made. Uh, but most of them are fabricated from pre-hardened steel. So I just make sure that I don't heat it up too much. But then high speed steel is uh, pretty resistant to heat. That's a famous fill a digression there. <laughs> okay, but wax thread. Yes, uh, it's uh, wax thread. Wax thread doesn't work with your pricking iron. I'm pretty sure it, it would. Um, can you tell me why you don't think wax thread works with your pricking iron? Maybe it's the size of the thread, the needles, the pricking iron itself, or the leather that you're using or how you're stitching. There's quite a few variables. I wouldn't rule out wax thread being the problem if there's a, a stitching issue. Most thread is wax. It allows uh, easier stitching, uh, less fraying, which is always a pain. Also wax helps the fibers stick together. So it does give a little bit more uh, toughness to the thread. When you have dry thread, unwaxed thread, it's a little bit more vulnerable. So you always want to kind of condition it really. So coming around the corner here, aiming for the center of the corner. So normally little boxes like this, a lot of them are, uh, are box stitched, but I've done quite a few courses featuring the box stitch. So this is going to be a little bit different. A very tough, but delicate looking jewelry case. There's a lot of reinforcement going on here. It's actually quite overbuilt in some areas. It will be tougher than it ever needs to be, but it doesn't look like it is. Because of course, being a small jewelry case in pink alligator, you want it to look kind of dainty. Uh, I think the thread is too thick for the kind of products. I use thread from a shoe factory and it's quite thick. Yeah, that's, I think you've answered your own question there. It's probably uh, the thread is a little bit too thick. Um, I mean, shoemakers use various thicknesses of thread. So it's not because it's from a shoemaker, but if, if it's the thread that they use to uh, sew in say uh, the welt, um, I mean, shoemaking is a whole different ball game to what I do, but uh, they tend to use quite thick thread, I believe. We'd hope so. It's got to hold the sole on. Certainly not going to be thin. Yeah, I've never, uh, I've never gone in for a pair of best spoke shoes. I will do one day, but I'm more of a boot man. I don't actually own a pair of shoes. I'm all about the boots. Everything in my collection is boots. The only shoes I have were probably sneakers, my trainers that I use for the gym. Apart from that, all boots, man. Every single pair. Don't know why. Uh, where, do you, where do you design your templates on a computer or draw them? Uh, I personally, I draw them, but I, I, I do things quite backwards compared to most people, I think. I actually make the product intuitively first. Uh, very little math or measurements. And then 
I work backwards from there once I have something that works and then I start measuring and taking measurements and create uh, my hand drawings and get all my notes down all my technical drawings and everything are usually on graph paper and then I send it to a friend of mine who then just uh, converts it all onto uh, a PDF so uh, otherwise I'd have to learn a whole new skill using Illustrator or something similar. But yeah, I'm a little bit old school in that sense. I don't start out with uh, measurements. I'll start out with sketches for sure. And I'll have a general idea of the size of the product I want. But generally I, I, I start before I have a full idea and then kind of adapt as I go along. And then once I'm happy with something that I've got, I then work out all the measurements, the mythology, the method methodology, the sequencing, that kind of thing. I work at a shoe factory, but we do not make bespoke shoes. We make uh, cemented sole shoes. One day I'll make a bespoke pair. I have to, it's my dream. <laughs> you definitely should. That'd be awesome. I usually go for uh, Goodyear welted shoes. That's my, uh, my preference. Makes for a very uh, tough, durable pair of shoes, but easy to repair as well. So we're about the halfway mark now. A little tiny uh, 10 stitches per inch. Does take a while to get through, especially when you're pushing through thick leather with an awl. <laughs> as you can imagine. Aria.home says, love your work. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. So this all is doing a really good job of getting through all these layers, five layers, because a lot of them are doubled over. And of course the zip tape. And there's two seams, top and bottom on this, so it's a decent amount of stitching. And it will take an evening to do but the results are definitely worth it. And the inside stitching, of course, is gonna be covered up with a lining, so no cast necessary on this one. And it's nice and thick, so it maximizes the, uh, the angles on the outside, which is really the telltale sign of hand stitching for those in the know. Mind you, there are a lot of uh, machines now with uh, that can do an angled stitch to make it look like hand stitching. Uh, trickery. Of course, Hermes are famous for doing that because uh, a lot of their products are not all hand stitched. Even their famous top end bags. So they uh, machine most of it, but there are parts that are finished by hand. But they uh, aim to make the machine stitching look like the hand stitching to give it a sense of consistency and to make it look like it's completely hand stitched. But of course it's not. Even at 10 grand plus. Sorry, I missed some, uh, missed some comments there. Uh, Philip, always nice to see you working from B Leather from Brazil. Dot BR, I suppose that was what that means. Does that bother you? Uh, what, uh, faux hand stitching? <laughs> Does it bother me? No, I don't think it bothers me. Um, no, maybe it does. I never really thought about it. <laughs> it is cheating a little bit, isn't it? Uh, you know, I can't sharpen my awls, see a lot of videos in vain, says Iman. Uh, I do have a video, Techniques uh, All Sharpening. Technique, what's it called now? Jeez. I've got like 62, 63 videos now. I'm trying to remember all the names. Uh, I think it's Details Make Perfection All Sharpening. And I take you through the process of... Uh, basically a terrible awl into something that's uh, mirror polished and just glides through leather. But yeah, it's, you know what, if, whether or not you watch the video, it's, it comes down to a lot of practice. 
you really have to get used to it going through the different layers of sanding uh, and then moving on to final polishing to get a really decent blade takes a bit of practice but I mean it's it's like knife sharpening but in miniature if you think about it that way so you know can you sharpen knives if you can sharpen knives to the point where they can pop hairs off your forearm then you know it's you should be able to put a lot of those techniques into all sharpening because it's not that different it's just smaller but you're going to need to start off with like a, a medium grit medium to medium fine and then work it right down to a, a polish polishing compound 10 grand for a Birkin that was made by a machine. Well, it's, you know, you can't say it's made by a machine. It's, I think it's actually impossible to make a bag completely by machine, but I know what you mean. Um, it's, it's still going to be hand assembled. All the parts are going to be hand assembled. Yes, it's pushed through a machine uh, for most of the stitching, but no, it's, it is still made by very, very skilled artisans who um, assemble it all by hand and finish certain parts by hand. You know, it is a, an iconic bag. And to be honest, what large brands with, with shareholders um, these days are hand-stitching everything. It's, it's, uh, it's mainly individual artisans and small boutiques that can, that can really afford to do that. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm still rooting for Hermes as one of the last brands that are still actively training their staff in the traditional methods, in the traditional way, even though they're adapting to modern times. And obviously there's a huge demand, even though they're, you know, very expensive bags, there's, there's a bigger demand than there is a supply. So I'm glad that they do exist. And instead of really cheapening everything, they train more artisans. So yeah, still a lot done by machine, which is a shame, but I'm grateful they exist, to be honest. Apologies to all those uh, who can hear the church bells going off in the distance. They are practicing this evening. <laughs> uh, what time is it there? The time is half past eight in the evening. Autumn Leather says, hello, Master, how are you? Hello, I'm very good, thank you. Yes, Brazil, Selma here. Hello, Selma. Hey from California, thanks for all the tips and tricks. You're very welcome. Scrolling down to the bottom is a relaxing time for me. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Vivian here from Brazil too. Ah, Brazil representing today. Uh, do you have a video for zippers? Yes, the one I'm currently making includes zippers. A lot of them make zippers. The previous course includes zippers. Terrain handbag, uh, Terrain luxury handbag. Include zippers. You've also got um, the de Havilland travel bag, of course. Include zippers. Fun fact in the UK, we call them zips. <laughs> Don't know why. Okay, almost there. I'm recording this on the big camera so that. Uh, you can watch this on YouTube if you like. So I can look on the camera and I see it's been 31 minutes and 48 seconds. So we're actually doing okay. Not too bad. Because there's a, a, a limit on Instagram Live, which is an hour. And normally I actually dump the lives. I don't, I don't keep them around. Because uh, they go out of sync. <laughs> That's the point of that. But this one seems to be doing well so far. I'm impressed. Well done, Instagram, sorting out the bugs. All right, so I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, can you show the inside of the jewelry case so we can see the layers? Is it possible? Not yet, not yet. There's not too much being revealed. It will be though, you'll see uh, videos coming out. Um, the making of, you know, I usually come out with like a course preview. So you'll see a little bit more. Uh, closer to the time. Sorry for the tease. Uh, will you please show how you finish your stitches, tying the knots? Uh, I could do, I guess. I might use the big camera. I don't think the 
this one's good enough because they're tiny, tiny stitches. Uh, but machine stitching doesn't mean lover boy quality, right? A lover boy. <laughs> I think that's an autocorrect. Maybe it's doing that because it's one of your more used words. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming uh, you mean you mean to say machine stitching doesn't mean bad quality. Uh, no, it doesn't necessarily mean bad quality. It's the only downside to machine stitching is uh, usually it's less durable, and when the stitching cuts, frays, gets damaged, uh, the stitching can unravel, compromising the integrity and the structure of the seam, and therefore the entire product. Um, hand stitching like this, where you've got, it's a little bit more like weaving. So you've got the thread going in and out, in and out, in and out. So if you cut one, you still have the other one running through, uh, which maintains the strength of the seam. And if you're doing a cast, or if you're stitching through several layers and the leather is tight like this, which really holds onto the thread, you know, you can cut one stitch on both sides and both both uh, pieces of thread get cut and compromised, but the seam still holds. Um, so hand stitching, it takes a lot longer, it takes skill. Uh, for a lot of companies, it's not financially feasible to, to have that, but uh, it does offer a superior product, yes. Does it mean bad quality? No, it just means that it's not gonna be as good, essentially. But saying that, there are some parts, depending on construction, that don't necessarily need the extra strength of hand stitching. Uh, if you're stitching in parts of very, very thin suede and, and material, then machine stitching is perfectly adequate because you can't really do a saddle stitch in them when it's really, really thin. So, you know, there are places where it's perfectly acceptable to do machine stitching on a bag, for example, the linings and things like that or areas that just aren't gonna get much wear and tear. So it really does come down to construction. Uh, would you ever start your own brand? I did, Finch England, that was my old brand. That's what I had before I started teaching. So that's what I earned my living through. And uh, before I transitioned to teaching, cause I just prefer, I enjoy teaching and kind of doing this kind of thing. Whereas it wasn't like that when you've got uh, a lot of orders to get through and you don't really have time to stop and video things or take photos of things or do lives and kind of really get into the craft and the teaching and bringing back historical techniques. Uh, all the things that I was really passionate about. I mean, it's great, it's still a, a wonderful job to do what you love for a living, but uh, something I love to do as well is teaching and helping other people to understand something that's given me so much joy and helped me earn a living. Uh, and that is uh, why I do what I do now. So yes, I did, I did have my own brand and I still use it on my products. As you can see, it's my brand. So those of you looking at this in uh, Instagram, this is a mirror image, I believe it's still doing that. Uh, it says Finch. So just scrolling down. <laughs> lower, <laughs> not lover. Hey, Philip, would you ever start? Oh, I've answered that one. Start your own brand. Ooh, there's a lot of people joining. No problem at all. I respect your call. It's your design. I was only curious about which stiffener you use, Salpa, Talan, or else. None of those, none of the above. Um, I'm, I'm more known for using leather as, as much as I can, where I can, where it's practical. Uh, I don't use Salpa or bonded leatherboard in my work. Um, just not my, uh, not my cup of tea. Instead of Salpa, a lot of the time I will use vegetable tan leather of equal firmness. Salpa works if you're a large brand and you, you know, you're looking to save money. and then you're, you know, you're making thousands of bags, then yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna save a profit, but that's the main reason large brands use it. 
And I think a lot of people think that because these large brands are, have made the decision to use a specific product, that it means that that's superior. Oftentimes it's cost savings because you could equally use bonded um, actual real leather, but it just costs a little bit more. Right, how are we doing for time? Right, okay, so 39 minutes. All right, otherwise the file size is gonna be too big. Okay, so this is the end of the live, guys. Thank you for joining me and all your questions and keeping the conversation going. It's always fun to uh, have a chat with you again. So this is the jewelry case course. Okay, I'll be coming out with the name soon and I'll be taking some more photos and explaining a little bit more about it. Um, how it's built, how it works, and also I'll be doing a video course preview so you can kind of see a little bit of the build along and how it all works. So if you're new to the craft and you've just joined me on this chat and it's your first time, don't forget to go to leathercraftmasterclass.com and check out the free tool guide, a 20 page article detailing how to buy tools, which tools you need, which are the best, which are unnecessary, and also a free video on how to select your own leathers. So thank you for joining me. And if you like this, don't forget to leave a comment below. If you're watching this on YouTube, give me a thumbs up. And you guys on Instagram, thank you for joining me. As always, it's been a pleasure. I'll see you next time.